everybody agrees that Wagner was a great genius. Uh, even the people who don't like Wagner's music, uh, because possibly they find it too much, they find it too overwhelming, they find it sort of dangerous possibly. There is a drug-like quality about it. It almost takes you over and some people don't like being taken over. And so there is, some people have that resistance to Wagner's music because it is so intoxicating and it, it is so magical and it's so powerful. I wonder if you could just recall the moment, if it was a moment, that you discovered Wagner. Well, I think we have to go back to my uh, student days, probably, in Manchester. I'd been an engineering student. I'd studied engineering for, for three years, civil engineering, up in Manchester. Qualified with a degree, but I'd been singing my whole life. And I had what people said was an unusual voice. So I went to the College of Music in Manchester to study singing. They fortunately accepted me. Uh, but I ran out of money. So I got a job in the chorus at Scottish Opera in 1968. And uh, uh, Alexander Gibson was conducting The Ring. And so my first contact with Wagner was then in 1968. I was one of the vassals in the chorus of Gutter Demerung. And uh, that was the first time I really heard at close quarters Wagner's music. And I was overwhelmed, particularly in that scene in Gutter Demerung, you know, where Hagen calls the vassals together in this uh, very aggressive, dangerous scene uh, where the mob uh, become very powerful and I was part of the mob on that occasion. You know as soon as I heard that music I had a feeling that that my voice and my actually my personality uh, and the way I think could be made for Wagner's music. Is it possible to keep the, the ideology of Wagner separate from the music? Well, if what you're getting at is, uh, let's say, uh, Wagner's anti-Semitism, for instance, uh, I find no anti-Semitism in any of the operas in any way. And so, uh, uh, if, I, if I did, I would be very unhappy with those operas and I would not sing those roles. But for me, take a role like Beckmesser in The Meistersinger, which some people say is representing a, a Jewish character and that it is uh, anti-Semitic. Uh, I don't find that in the least. Beckmesser has a very important role in the opera, which is to represent the rules and perfectionism, exactness, precision, as against Walter, the tenor who comes in, who represents freedom and creativity and lack of structure. I, I would say the same is exactly true of Mima in Siegfried and Rheingold in the ring. Sometimes people say he is a representation, some caricature of, of Jewishness. And uh, I would disagree with that on similar grounds, that the character has a very, very important function in the piece. Uh, and uh, I don't see it as being an anti-Semitic representation. If I did, I would not be happy to sing in that opera. She anders schreitet sie als sonst Wirkte dies der heilige Tat Gott hat der Gnade und der Leiche Storytelling is one of the basic building blocks of Wagner operas and one of the reasons is that all the thematic material in the music comes back again and again. Every time the story is told, the themes associated, let's say, with, in this case, with Klingsor, with Amfortas, with the spear, with the grail, with the temple, with Titoral, with Gurnemans, with all, all these uh, themes, musical themes, the leitmotiv, and that's one of the wonderful things about Wagner operas. They all go back into the past retell the story, always with variation, always bringing out new facts that we hadn't previously known, and always with the redevelopment of the, theme, of the musical themes, so that the tapestry of the piece is woven more and more richly as the piece goes on. 
I would love it if you could just describe the experience of singing on the stage of the opera house that he had built for himself. Mm. Yes, in 1985 or so, Daniel Barenboim phoned up and said that he'd like me to sing Vortan in his new ring at, at Bayreuth. And I was absolutely astounded. Didn't know if I'd be able to, to do it actually with my bass voice singing a bass baritone part. But I was very uh, inspired by the idea. And uh, that, I think, in my working life, those years from, let's say, 87 to the first rehearsals we had in Bayreuth in 87 for the new ring, Harry Kupfer uh, uh, directing, until the last performances in 92, which were recorded on DVD and they've been very successful ever since and, and seen by many people. Uh, those were very special years for me. Uh, Bayreuth is a very special place. Uh, um, I love the building. I love the acoustic. I love the ideas that Richard Wagner put into the building, you know, the covered pit so that the orchestra is not visible. Uh, I love the sort of austerity of the building. There's no Rococo decoration on it. It's not a grand operatic building. It's a very practical, pragmatic building for, for the serious business of music drama. Wagner were to materialise in front of you and you had the chance just to shoot one question at him, do you have any idea what it might be? What a question. I think I would, I would ask, when did he find his musical voice? Because the early part of his life, his early compositions, are not really Wagner at all. You know, he, he wrote, you know, the, the Liebesverbot up to Rienzi, uh, and uh, Die Feen, and the, those are their things. Uh, almost copying other people, almost imitating other people, and, and exploring the world of, of, of music as it was, not really creating his own musical world. But then all of a sudden, it began with The Flying Dutchman, uh, but then from then on, this incredible... A Wagnerian world of music is born. And I would ask him, when did you first have the inkling that you had the key to that world? Where did it come from? Because he's unique in composers in this, in this sense. The, the, the first compositions are very average works. And then the last half of his life the, the works are just of, in, of staggering genius. They're just in, the greatest works ever composed. And how did that happen? 